<laughs> All right. So these folks are on an alternative spring break program. They're volunteering in a few schools, so they'd like to hear a little bit from you, and then they have time to question. I, I'll keep the, the little part uh, in mind. Um, Let's see, I have uh, been serving as the Chancellor of the Washington DC schools for about 20 months now. Uh, came in, uh, 21 months now maybe? Um, came in uh, in June of 2007 when the mayor took mayoral control of the schools. Um, our school district is widely known as the worst performing, most dysfunctional school district in the country. Um, and the data backs that up. Just to give you a sense, we are the only school district in the country that is on high-risk status with the U.S. Department of Education. We have a, an achievement gap between our white kids and our black kids of 70 percentage points at the secondary level. Um, of all of the ninth graders who begin high school with us, only 9% of them graduate from college. And of all of our eighth graders, uh, only 8% of them are in grade level in mathematics, 8%. 12% in, in, in reading, which means that 92% of our kids do not have the skills and knowledge necessary to be productive members of society. So essentially, we do kids a disservice every single day. Um, the data also show that the longer kids stay in our system, the worse off they are. Um, so our kids, our kindergartners start off relatively on par with kindergartners in other cities who look like them. Um, but by the time they reach the fourth grade, there's several grade levels below. In fact, our poor black fourth graders are two grade levels behind the poor black fourth graders in New York City. And those kids are already several grade levels below their white counterparts. Um, so you're almost better off staying home than you are coming to school in DC public schools every day. That's the sort of tough reality that we have to deal with. Um, despite all of that, I have a tremendous amount of faith and confidence that we can turn uh, that circumstance around in the city. We have, uh, I think, an unprecedented um, level of kind of community, both outrage and, so, and, and sort of outrage at, at the situation and um, just, I, I think people are fed up with having the schools as bad as they are. I think it's an embarrassment to this country that the nation's capital is in this situation. I think that Barack Obama is hoping that, you know, in his front yard now, um, you know, we don't have the worst outcomes for kids um, in, in the entire nation. And even, you know, if you look at us compared to some third, third world countries. Um, and, and so for those reasons and the fact that we have an incredibly courageous mayor who doesn't care about politics, who doesn't care about you know, opposition, and who is willing to make incredibly difficult decisions to put schools um, as the number one priority in the city. Um, and so for all of those reasons, I think it's just uh, uh, an exciting time in DC. Um, I was probably the most unlikely, unpopular, whatever you want to call it, pick for a chancellor that um, Fenty could have possibly made. Um, when they announced me, people across the city were saying, what on God's green earth is Adrian Fenty thinking, hiring a 37-year-old Korean girl from Toledo, Ohio, who's never run a school, much less a school district? Um, and why does he think that she is the person to do this? Um, and so we've had to deal with that, I think, ever since. Um, but uh, despite that sort of early on and, and the incredibly aggressive um, stance that we've taken towards reforms, I think that generally in the city there's a, a feeling that there's a tremendous amount of momentum towards this. And I think for the first time in a long time, people are feeling like there's hope for the public schools. Um, so we're excited about that as well. So. Um that are for yeah, please. So yeah, we've been uh, s studying uh, inequality in DC schools for a couple of months now for the trip, and um, throughout our, our trip, we've been visiting a lot of schools, public and, and charter, and um, so, uh, and we've been uh, talking a lot about uh, standardized test scores, which we know is uh, a major factor in uh, um, the plan you've brought forth. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we'd like to ask, uh, do you think that there are any aspects of education that can't be measured by data? And do you worry that database decision making can hinder the intellectual growth of a student? No. 
I think that if we can't measure it, we're not going to do it. You have to be able to measure whether or not what you're doing is having an impact, particularly when you're in the circumstance that we are with our kids. Does that mean standardized tests are the end all be all? No, because there are multiple ways. You know, yesterday I sat through a 12 hour city council hearing, uh, and you know, one of the council members said, you know, well, one plus one equals two. One plus one equals two. It always is it one plus one equals two. I was like, right, but there are multiple ways to measure whether a kid knows that one plus one equals two, right? One is a standardized test, but you can ask them the question, you can ask them to do it with manipulate. I mean, there are lots of ways to measure that. So I don't think standardized tests are the only way, the only tool. Um, but the issue, the reason why we're in the situation that we're in right now is that n no one has been focused on measuring in a real way how poorly our kids are doing and holding adults accountable for the lack of progress. So it is a culture that's almost allergic to accountability. And we, and, and we, have, to, we have to shift that. Um, there are lots of things that, that our schools have to do outside of, of just teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic that are incredibly important as well. But I, I also think that all of those things can be measured. Um, uh, you know, there's 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 great surveying you can do. I mean, er, everything that you do and everything that you put public taxpayer dollars towards, I feel like you have to be able to say this is what's going to be the outcome, and here's how we measure it. Um, how do you think de facto? Like, I mean, obviously there's extensive de, de facto segregation in D.C. The city and in D.C. the schools, um, and how do you think that that uh, affects the inequality of educational opportunities that some students might receive? So I think this whole segregation issue is a little tough. And you know, in this country, there was a, a sort of huge push towards desegregation for a while. Um, I think that making sure that white kids are learning next to black kids is not quite frankly as important as making sure that schools are achieving. Um, and you know, we have some schools in this city where white kids are learning next to black kids, and the black kids aren't doing any better than they are at the fully segregated African American, you know, American high schools. So just by virtue of the fact that the 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 the, the, the school is desegregated doesn't really mean anything different in terms of the outcomes for kids. Um, now, back in the day, I I get why, but sort of for where we are now, I think it's 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 a distraction to talk about that. I think that what we really need to talk about is why poor kids get the shaft, um, why um, we are all too willing to put up with the outcomes that we do for this population of kids. I'll, I'll say this, one of the things that um, people often tell me is they say, you know, we love you, you seem smart and energetic and focused and you know, all that sort of stuff, but there's no way you're gonna be able to be successful because Schools are a reflection of the communities that they're in. And as long as in this country we have the economic inequalities that we do, then we're always going to have the educational disparities that we have. Um, and I, I always think that's very interesting. I, I talked not, I met long, not long ago with Warren Buffett, who, richest man in the world, I figured he's like probably the smartest man in the world. And he said to me, he said, it is very easy to fix public education in this country. Really, well, how you want to fill me in? And he said, All you would have to do is make private schools illegal and assign every kid to a public school by random lottery. So, what that would mean in Washington, D.C., is that if every ambassador's kid, every CEO's kid, every congressman's kid was required to go to a DCPS school by lottery. And that would mean that half of them would be going to Anacostia for their education. You would never see a faster movement of resources from one side of the city to the other. All right? And we're, we, we are willing to let kids languish. I don't know what schools you've been to, but we have some of the crappiest schools, I think, in this country, in this, in this city. You would never want your kids to go to those schools. You know, you, 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 we can't expect anyone 
in good conscience to want to send their kids to school. And these lawmakers are making decisions every day. You know, yeah, well, we don't want vouchers. Vouchers take money away from public schools. And meanwhile, they're not putting their kids in those schools where those poor kids are expected to go every day. So they're saving their children and expecting other people to let their children languish in those schools that they would never in a million years put their own kids in and, and driving public policy off of that. So, you know, the whole thing with desegregation is around race. Maybe if the desegregation stuff was around class. Yeah, I think they're know, probably related. <laughs> it, you know, then, yeah. then it might be a different story. But I, I, I think that the, that the sort of focus is, is, is kind of on the wrong thing with all the deseg stuff. It's mm -hmm. complicated. Um, so we've heard from a lot of the teachers that we've spoken to that in recent years it's just been a lot of upheaval, different superintendents coming in and moving. Um, so why do you think your administration is going to be different? That's a good question. I mean, you can't blame the people, the employees of this district for feeling um, what they do. And I always say that, that they, they probably have change fatigue. Um, at this point, right? Superintendents come and go. I'm the, I think, seventh superintendent in 10 years. Everybody comes in with their ideas, and they've been told, do this program, do that program, do the other thing. And, you know, it's different from what people were telling them to do two years ago or five years ago or whatever. Um, why do I think I'm going to be different? Um, I think that there is no superintendent anywhere in the country or, or in the history of D.C who has had the momentum, the political capital of a, of a mayor, the latitude, the, the willingness of, of funders to invest, like all of these things, I think all these stars are aligned right now in a way that I don't think has ever been the case. Um, so for those reasons, I think that this is gonna be different. I'm sure that Cliff Janey would have told you the same thing three years ago, though, um, who was my predecessor. So I'm sure everybody to a certain a point, extent thinks that. But that, I mean, I truly do believe that. I think it's a certain point in time. I don't, I don't think that I could do the same things that I'm doing and have the same impact in St. Louis. Because we are the nation's capital, because we just had a new African-American president elected, for all these reasons, I think we have the ability to do something in this country that, that's never been done before. But it's because of all those random factors of which I control none. <laughs> um, considering the high turnover rate of TFA teachers, and we've seen a lot of those in the various schools we've listened to, uh, we've been to, and we've also read studies that indicate that it takes generally about three plus years for a teacher to become fully effective uh, in the classroom. Why do you promote the program so strongly? Um, a few reasons. First of all, just just to be clear, the what the data shows is that by the third by your third year of teaching, really you don't get any better after your third year. You don't get radically better. I mean, where you are in your third year is sort of you know where you're going to be. Um, but my my I have, a, I have a few philosophies. One, Teach for America has a two pronged mission. One is to bring people into teaching positions. The other is that these people will go off and do things in life, be important people, whatever, and have had the experience of being a public school teacher. I cannot tell you the power of that. <clears throat> if you look at the governors, the senators, the congressmen, the, there are an inordinate number of those people who are being advised right now by Teach for America alumni. That's gonna change the way those legislators are voting and thinking and everything else. People who are running foundations in this country, people who are driving some of the most exciting education reform efforts in this country are Teach for America alum. And so the more we can you know, ha ensure that young people are having this important experience in an urban school and then going off and doing things that are gonna impact the world, I think is great. Two, I would rather have an effective teacher for two years than an ineffective teacher for 20 years. It doesn't bother me about you come in for two years and you leave. As long as you do a good job while you're here, I'm good. Now that doesn't mean that I don't think retention is important and that we're not going to invest in trying to keep people as long as we can. But you know, there's no other profession in the world that expects that people are going to come in and stay there for 30 years. It's just not. If you look at the data about people of your generation, 
you're going to change careers between five and seven times over over your lifespan. So people at McKinsey and people at, you know, Lehman Brothers might be a bad example. I don't know, <laughs> Citibank and all these other places aren't expecting you to do that job forever. They just want you to be effective in, you know, the time frame that you're going to be there. And that's, that's, the, that's the take that I have. I've got a question. Um, you talked about the flow of resources, how that would, you know, ch like spread out all over the district if these, you know, affluent people were, you know, had their kids in these schools. But I think that we found that a big part of this 70% achievement gap does not come from, you know, resources. It doesn't come from, you know, a lack of funds. Because a lot of these schools are, are, you know, they've got nice classrooms, they've got computers. I think I think we we feel like you know in the home there's the huge differences um, b between like you know support from parents, the values being taught by the parents, <coughs> you know the cultural and social capital and so like even though we have schools like Kip who are you know having seen great academic achievements, the kids are still you know they've still got they're still coming from these backgrounds and. So I'm just wondering if you think that this, the gap between, the, you know, the Southeast kids, the you know, predominantly African American kids, and the white kids, if there's a social and cultural capital gap, will that be closed? Do you think just through academic achievement, or, I mean, do you think that ever will close? And how are your policies? You know. So is this question um, and. <clears throat> a good friend of mine, Joel Klein, um, says that people believe that you can't solve the problems of public education until you solve the problems of poverty. And he believes it's the other way around. That you're never going to solve the problem of poverty until you solve the problem of public education. And so when you're in a situation like we're in, where our kids, the vast majority of my kids come to school facing ridiculous challenges every day. They're not properly cared for, they don't have proper nutrition, proper health care, you know, basic, basic things. You know, we have seven-year-olds who are responsible for taking care of their younger brothers. I mean, this is the circumstance that our kids are in. So is it difficult? Absolutely. Is it, is it, are these challenges that impact their readiness to learn at the schoolhouse door? Absolutely. <coughs> but are they... Are they prohibitive factors to their academic achievement? No. If we have the right adults in school buildings, having high expectations of kids, and being absolutely 100% committed to their success, then we can overcome every single one of those obstacles. And to your point, that that's what the KIPP schools show, right? Just the same neighborhoods, same poor black kids, achieving at ridiculously high levels. Okay, I follow up? Yeah. Um, I guess, the capital gains program, do yes. you, I mean, you know, that's a pretty strong show of, I mean, we're teaching those kids that education is, is about being rewarded, isn't it? Is we that? teach all kids that. Kids out in the suburbs, when they bring home their report cards, you get $10 for every A and $5 for every B, and if, if you're rich, you know, and you do well on a test, you get taken out to dinner, you get a shiny red convertible. Like that's the way I is out in the suburbs and people don't consider that you're bribing those kids, right? I mean, that's just the reality. So this, I, I mean, somebody, this, uh, when I started Capital Gains, I got this deluge of um, emails and letters and stuff from all, a lot of old people saying, it is a sad day <laughs> when you have to pay children to do the things that they should be doing anyways. And I said, no, yesterday was a sad day when 8% of our children, our 8th graders, were on grade level, and we weren't really willing to do anything about it. We have to think of every possible innovative solution that we can to go at this problem. And quite frankly, our children have every incentive to do the wrong thing out on the streets. There's huge incentive to deal drugs, be a runner, all that sort of stuff. Why wouldn't we counterbalance that with incentives to do the right thing in schools? This idea that you know somehow we're going to create this environment where kids think that you know you're going to get something for doing your work. I do. I get a paycheck every two weeks. 
I'm not, I'm not doing this job out of the goodness of my heart and not making any money out of it. So the fact, some idea that we're setting a bad precedent just doesn't, doesn't hold water. And, and furthermore, even if we sort of are putting something in kids' minds, I think it's the right thing, which is come to school every day, behave, do the right thing, and you will, there will be a benefit in the end for you. Um, is there data that show that TFAs are more effective in the two years that they're teaching at public schools? Um, and are, are they are they better? So in the two years that they're serving um, in the public schools, is there data show that they are better than those teachers who pursue a, a traditional teacher preparation? There program? is there is some data that show, there's 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 like all kinds of studies, um, and if you ask people which studies are the best and which studies are the worst, I mean, they'll give you different sort of answers. But I think the most credible um, uh, studies on Teach for America have been by Tom Kane out of Harvard and um, Mathematica, and both of them show that Teach for America teachers are m more effective. Now, are they hugely more effective? No. Um, but they, you know, they're, they're more effective. And I'll say this, you know, from an anecdotal standpoint, when I walk into schools across the city, when I see people who are trying really hard and, and some of them who are knocking it out of the park, almost undoubtedly they're a Teach for America or, or a teaching fellow, like a, 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 a pretty significant amount of the time. I walked into, um, I don't know if you guys have been to Anacostia High School yet. It's a sad place, right? I mean, it is a sad place. Uh, and um, I walked into a classroom well, I walked into a lot of classrooms where absolutely nothing was going on. And I walked into one classroom where the teacher was actually trying to teach and the kids seemed, you know, engaged. It wasn't the best lesson I've ever seen, but but it was solid. And I asked one of the kids, I said, so what do you think about this teacher, this Teach for America guy? And he said, he's my best teacher. And I said, why? So because this guy, he, he, he tries to explain things to you if you don't understand. And he tries to teach us new things. Other teachers, they just hand you a worksheet or whatever. They won't talk to you. But this guy tries to do those two things. It's like, how sad is that? That your best teacher is your best teacher because he tries to explain things to you and he attempts to teach you new things. We have lowered the expectations of our kids to that level. Sad. So if all my Teach for America teachers do is try to explain things and teach new things, I'm good on that. That's not where we're gonna. It's not where we need to be. Two, three, six, ten years from now, but given the situation that my kids face every day, I'll take it. Um. Other than the teachers who aren't properly certified who've been fired, um, uh, well, we've seen a lot of teachers who uh, simply don't have the resources to be effective teachers, um, the professional support and that sort of thing. So um, how would you justify firing ineffective teachers when they don't have the necessary um, support resources? And that sort of thing? So I think this is a little overdone. I mean, we spend $14,000 a kid in this system, and I have told every single teacher directly if you lack something, if you don't have paper or pencil or books or whatever, email me directly and I will make sure that you get those things. So the materials wise, there's, there's just no excuse for, for, for people not having those things in their classroom. The professional supports are something different. So if you look right now, our evaluation tool, we have something called a 90 day plan so you can remove an ineffective teacher from the classroom supposedly in 90 days, it, it, it sounds a lot more streamlined than it is um, but part of that plan is that we identify the the struggling teacher and then part of what we are required to do is assign them a helping teacher to give them one-on-one -on -one support to improve their practices here's the bottom line with with your question though for me my two kids I have two kids a seven-year-old and a ten-year-old they go to DC public schools if I showed up to school on day one and the principal looked at me and said, this is Olivia's teacher. Guess what? She's not so good. But we are going to spend this year trying to professionally develop her. 
Meanwhile, Olivia and her 23 classmates may not learn how to read, but we think that's the right thing to do for this teacher. I would never accept that. None of you would ever accept that reality for your kids. But we have scores of children in this city who don't have the adult advocates in their lives to be able to navigate their way through the system and say, absolutely not, right? So we have children languishing in classrooms of ineffective teachers. So say we decide that year for that teacher, okay, it's, it's worthwhile to invest in this teacher so she, because to be fair to her, we should professionally develop her. What if those kids then, particularly given the fact that the research shows that for especially poor minority kids, if you have three effective teachers in a row versus three ineffective teachers in a row, it can change your life trajectory, right? So we wasted one year. What if those kids are unlucky enough to get an ineffective teacher the next year? Are we willing to, to waste two-thirds of that kid's opportunity in life so that we can professionally develop two adults? Are you putting your kid in that classroom while that, while that teacher gets professionally developed? So the, part of the problem, I think, in education, and particularly in urban education, has been that, that we have been all too willing to turn a blind eye to what is happening to children in classrooms in the name of harmony amongst adults. Let's keep the adults happy. Let's professionally develop the adults, that sort of thing. But in the meantime, we've been robbing kids of an education. That's just, that's not acceptable. You know, there's all this media right now about uh, where I am with the teachers unions, and they say she's fighting with the teachers unions, she's inflexible and she won't be willing to give. And to a certain extent, that's true. If there are things that are good for adults and have a neutral impact on kids, I'm good. I will give as many of those things as you want me to in the contract. But if there are things that are good for adults but have a negative impact on kids, that's a non-negotiable for me. I will not compromise what is in the best interest of kids so that the adults can have their rights and privileges. That's, that's been the problem in public education to date. Um, now, all that said, I believe in professional development. There are lots of people in our system who want to get better, um, and we, we are obligated to invest um, in that. We, have, it, we increased from last school year to this school year, we increased our, um, our spending on professional development for teachers 400%. So it's not that I that I don't that I that I sort of believe that with a broad brush we should just fire everybody. And, oh, that's not true. But all of those decisions should be made, balancing out what what are we what are we losing? What's what's the downside, and who is that downside impacting? Can I just um, follow up on sure. that question real quickly? Um, I mean, so there's material resources and professional development, um, but what about things like? Um, I, I spoke to a Spanish teacher at Bunker Hill Academy or Elementary, mm -hmm. um, and she said, uh, I teach this class, there's four students that have special education needs. I have no support for that. Uh, if I take 40 minutes to get them on task, then the rest of the class doesn't learn. Um, so that's a resource that's neither a material nor a professional development necessarily that she's clearly lacking. Um, so how, you know, so maybe she's not as effective as she could be, but how would you uh, how would you say to that teacher that she is ineffective, so maybe she should be fired when she just doesn't have that support? So here's, here's the thing. I, again, let's go back to my Anacostia example. I sat in a room with a group of kids with a really solid teacher. Um, kids were engaged, going through a great lesson, whatever, whatever. Left that room, I saw some of the kids walking out the door. This is at 9.30 in the morning. I said, where are you going? And we're like, well, that lady's good. But the picture that we have next is not so good. So we're leaving. <laughs> they're making rational decisions about where they're spending their time. When I, you go and talk to that teacher, the other teacher, and she will tell you that those kids are out of control, that they're discipline problems, that she's not getting any support from the administration to deal with the, the same kids the same group of three boys who in this person's classroom, I mean, I've actually seen this happen. There was, um, I went into a special education in, uh, classroom um, where this, this, this one teacher was huge. I mean, he must have been 6'9", huge African-American guy. I mean, if the kids are going to be scared of somebody, you're going to be scared of him and listen to him. The kids were bouncing off the wall, swearing at him trying to light fires in the trash can. I mean, if anybody had something to complain about, based on what you saw, 
it would be this guy, right? The kids were nuts. One of them, you know, shouts at him, screams, throws something at him, and then bolts, right? Running down the hallway, this little Asian lady, you know, 110 pounds dripping wet, comes out, Jamal, you know, yes, miss, whatever her name is, Wang, what are you doing? He's like, looking all sheepish, she's like, are you supposed to be running through the hall? No, ma'am. What should you do? I'm going to turn back. I mean, so the you know the same kids who, who some people are saying they're out of control. I can't teach with them and that sort of thing. It, you know, other teachers actually can 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 handle. Um, now there are some circumstances that are absolutely valid, right? Um, and we as a system have to do a better job of um, making sure that people have what they need to be successful. So for example, if those four special education kids are supposed to have dedicated aides who sit with them in the classroom and she doesn't have those, then that's a significant problem. That's a problem that we're obligated to solve. And if she can't be as effective as she can be because she doesn't have those people, then that is absolutely warranted. But that's why we're telling people there, there can't be any excuses. If you need things that you're not getting, you gotta tell us so we can get them to you. But just sort of saying, well, I can't do it because X, Y, and Z, or I don't have it, then, then that's actually not okay. So there are circumstances, I think, that are absolutely legitimate um, where we're not getting people the things that they need, and in those cases, you know, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that that happens. But, the, but I, don't, I think it's sometimes not always, you know, not always the case. Um. Along those lines, um, you've been talking about resources, and you also mentioned uh, being concerned about why poor kids get the shaft. Um, we visited Hart Middle School this week, and uh, seventh graders there told us that they feel as though they're being ignored because of who they are and because of where they live. And um, from what we gathered, it seems that the sad reality is that they're being ignored. Um, one uh, well, one example is that the the building doesn't have heat, and a boy told us that his mother called five times about the problem. Um, yet they sat through classes this winter uh, without coats in a building without heat. And um, I just I just want to know, as the chancellor who puts the kids first, uh, how do you explain that? So I've never heard about a building not having heat. Parts of the building didn't have heat. Some classrooms didn't have heat. So again, this is all about, you know, this is why I tell people that when there's a problem, they have to email me directly. Because we have a system, right? This is a broken, dysfunctional system. It didn't become that way overnight. It's become that way over decades. And um, so we're not going to be able to fix everything overnight. But what I tell people is to email me directly or call me directly and tell me when you have a problem. Uh, now, long term, is that the solution, right? No. God forbid, 10 years from now, we're in a situation where if the second floor water fountain at Watkins Elementary doesn't work, you have to email the chancellor. But in the short term, people in this district will listen when I tell them to do something. Unfortunately, they don't always listen when the teacher or a principal or someone else tells, asks them to do something. But they will listen when I tell them to do something, which is why I tell everyone, if you have to bring your problems directly to me to get solved, then that's the way that it is. Um, unfortunately, we have a, a culture of, um, of sort of, you know, this weird hierarchy. Like, people have learned over time that you're not allowed to, you know, go around people to this people. So I have upset a lot of people by telling kids, parents, teachers, whoever, if you have a problem, email me directly. Um, I, I, it, that surprised me only because I, I just placed the principal who's there at the school. I don't think that he would ever tolerate um, kids being in a classroom where there's no heat. Um, but I will certainly ask him about it. In terms of the kids saying, you know, they feel like they're being ignored, they, they are. I mean, the kids know this more than anybody. Yeah. 
Um, the kids know. I mean, I, I met two kids. The six, the seventh graders are are are, are uh, a tough crowd, but the um, the sixth graders there are gems. They are like their achievement levels. They're incredibly well behaved. I mean, it, and I was at a a, a geo plunge competition in the district, which is like this geography B type thing. And we've been around from table to table talking to the kids, and there was this group of kids from Hart, sixth graders. And um, the, there's TV cameras following me around. And this little girl looked at me and she said, we would like you to tell these people, you know, the reality about the kids at heart. We are diligent, we are hardworking, we are capable. And everyone just assumes that because we go to heart that we, you know, can't behave. It. The kids will tell you the reality more than anyone else. The kids at Anacostia will tell you you know exactly what the situation is, exactly what's wrong and what's right with their school, exactly which teachers teach them well and don't. So that's why I spend as much of my time as I possibly can with kids, because they are the ones that you can get the you know incredibly straight story from, um, and that's what keeps me grounded too. I mean, again, this is a system of fifty thousand kids. We have one hundred and twenty schools. I wish that I could fix everything right away. I can't. But the thing that, that, that keeps me grounded and keeps me fired up about doing my job every day is any time I talk to kids and they tell me some of the things that are going on in these schools, it's criminal. I'll take one more question. Um, we've consistently heard that mismanagement of funds is a reason that a lot of these schools are deprived of resources, but that wouldn't really explain why some schools in poor communities, maybe like Hart, are deprived of the resources that some schools in, say, North uh, West have. Um, why, as you said, uh, communities, the schools communities have reflect the communities themselves. Why do poor communities produce less resource schools? I mean, DCPS allots the same amount, supposedly, to every student in the district. So why do these schools? Well, we actually, there's a, if you look at the data, the schools in our city that serve the lowest income kids have essentially more resource. They have lower class size, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so mismanagement is a problem, has been a problem in this system for decades. Um, I still am uncovering things. 21 months into this job, I am still uncovering things that just make you want to cry. You know, people at our warehouse who are intercepting computers before they go out to the classrooms, before they get tagged and stealing them, or, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, so that stuff is happening, that, without a doubt. One of the things, if you look at the first year that I came in, we spent $403 million at the school level, so not central office, $403 million. The second year, that I was in office, we raised that to about 120 million. Next year, it'll be, I'm sorry, we raised it to 420 million. The next year, it'll be about 434. So we have been radically increasing the amount of money that's going to schools, while, even while the, the student population has decreased. So that means you're, we're, we're spending more money per kid at the school site. Whether those resources are all being utilized in a way that, that the kids can feel, that's, I, I can't, we, we still can't say that that's happening. We have lots of schools in the system that are still way under-enrolled, and the problem with having under-enrolled schools is we're operating way too many schools, which means that your resources are spread out over more schools, which means that you're paying to, you know, heat and air condition and light, half school, half, half full buildings. If you can right size the district, right, it allows you to have a more effective use of the resources, which we, we closed 23 schools last year, much to the chagrin of lots and lots of people here. But it was the right thing to do. Through that move, we were able to fund a, an art teacher, a music teacher, a PE teacher, a librarian, and a nurse at every single one of our schools, which is the first time in the history of Washington, D.C. that that's happened, sadly enough. So people don't like it necessarily. But, you know, it's a, it's a reality of where we are. I think the allocation of resources and ensuring that kids are feeling the amount of money that we're spending is still a few years off until that really becomes a reality. 
Um, another huge impediment to that is we spend about 30% of our budget on special education because we're in all of these consent decrees and court orders. So for example, we spent $74 million last year to transport a few thousand special education kids through the system. It equaled almost $18,000 per kid per year just on transportation. I thought, $18,000 a year, you can buy the kid a Saturn the first year and a driver for the Saturn every year after that for $18,000. It seems like the biggest waste of money ever. But because we're under a consent decree, there's a court-appointed special master who, who is in charge of transportation. All he has to do is get the kids to where they're supposed to be, because we've never been able to do that in the past, and all we can do is pay the bill. We have no ability to control costs. It's a crazy. It's going to take us a couple of years to get out of that consent decree so that we can actually begin to operate that in a more efficient way. But because of the complete dysfunction of the district leading up to then, the court felt like they had no choice but to do that so that at the very least, forget the money for a second, the kids, especially the kids, were getting to school every day. All right. It was nice to meet all of you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.